Yes, ma'am. Continue. Okay. So here we are, everyone. Good evening. Welcome to the book club. We have another session with another interesting book. And uh, the title today is India in the Persianate Age. And our presenter is Runa Mukherjee. Now, it's saying that Runa has uh, managed to straddle both the... the, the Girls Colleges of Delhi University. She did her undergrad studies from Lady Sri Ram College and her postgrad from Miranda House. Similarly, she's managed to work in the civil services and the corporate sector. There we get straddling to uh, opposite poles, right? Uh, she started her career in the railways, then went on to a semi corporate situation, and then all out corporate. So she's had marvelous experience. And I think even now she is director in some companies and buzzes around to attend these meetings and whatnot. So Runa and, uh, well, Runa has always been a terrific reader and she's always been very analytic, which I can vouch for because she was my batchmate and we studied together. Um, she has got a very developed aesthetic sense. She's good at art, she embroiders. But today we're concerned with the fact that she reads. And the book that she has chosen to present today deals with history. So Runa, over to you. Tell us about it. Yes. And everyone, oh, yes. Yes, I think the first thing I would like to say is, I would like to start with disclaimers. Number one, I'm not a historian. I'm not all that well read in history, so I don't know a lot of the nitty gritty. But, you know, I, I do, I would like to know about where we are, how we got from here to there, and so on and so forth. So one is a little interested, and I find that if you're interested in sociology and how people change and how societies change and economic trends and literary trends, you automatically get you, you, you need to know a little bit of the historical background. And uh, uh, charity starts at home, therefore one should know more about India and how we got here, what we are, because we are a product of our various strands and threads of history. And India is a really marvelous place. I mean, it's, it's, uh, never been an isolated country. I mean, a lot of people, I mean, there was a thought once upon a time that it was isolated, but it never, ever, ever was, right? From ancient times and for this particular period. Anyway, we'll go straight into it. Um, I'll just start my screen share, okay? Uh, how do I do this? Okay. Uh, press screen share. Just. Huh. Okay, yeah, right. Yeah, yes, we can see. Okay. Right. Now, uh, India and the Persian age. <clears throat> As I said, it was my brother who put me in the way of this book, because he has started to learn Persian. And Persian meaning Farsi. And uh, he says, you know, I find that uh, I connect so much to the language. And this one thing which he and I share, we, a view we share is that language is a window to a culture. It's not just a means of communication. It's really the window to a culture because the idioms, the thoughts, everything, metaphors, they express a world view and a shared taste. And I'm sure all of you globetrotters have realized that whenever you go in the world, go out in the world, if you manage to speak even one or two lines in the local language, you know, the connection that you make with the other person is immediate and instant. You, you establish a rapport which you cannot do in any other way. And that is what language represents and therefore I'm interested in linguistics as well. So there we are. So anyway, this was my brother and he says, you know, then there is this book which talks of India in the Persian age. And what does it mean? Uh, why Persian it? So we'll 
go straight into it. Oops. Now, um, how do I go into slide? Okay, some little help is required. Yes, right arrow. I want to go to the next. Uh... Yeah, ma'am, uh, on the keyboard you can press right arrow. Okay. Nothing's happening. Or oh, the point, pointy down arrow, I would say. Ah, now it's happening. Ah, ah okay. Yeah. Okay. This I need to move. Yeah. Okay. So uh, we are talking about a period. Let's start like this. Yeah. Okay. We are talking about a period which is from uh, 1000 AD or CE, as they say, up to 1765 CE. Um, why this period? Because 1000 is roughly uh, the time, it's the 11th century when India received, uh, uh, received uh, raids. I will have to say it started with raids. And actually the author starts with the, the story of Mohammed of, uh, uh, Mohammed of uh, Ghazni and his raid on the Somnath temple. It starts with that and 1765 is virtually the end of the Mughal era uh, because it is the date on which um, the uh, nominal uh, uh, Mughal emperor in Delhi granted the Diwani of Bengal to the British East India Company. And granting a Diwani, I mean, I, I read it in, in school, but I didn't know what it meant. Granting a Diwani means you're virtually making them governor of a state and empowered to collect all the revenues, transmit the tribute to the, to the, to the crown as it were, and keep the rest for themselves. That's a Diwani. So, it's basically the toehold the British East India Company got, and uh, which was the beginning of uh, the colonial era because that's how they went on from there. So, uh, so therefore this period spans what a uh, lot of us think of as the Mughal period or even the Muslim period. Uh, but uh, the author, is at great pains to point out that uh, you know this 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 identification of this period, typically with a religion as Muslim, was something which started only with the British colonials in the 19th century, when they came here and they had a lot of you know his yeah that's one of the first things we all see history with our own uh, perspective, where we come from our own ideas we have we have a lot of preformed ideas, we have our own experiences, and we approach history like that. It's very difficult to come out of it. We are now in the modern age. We are living through a lot of things now which color our own perception of the past. And it's very, very easy to interpret the past through the lens of the present. Whereas most possibly in the past, I mean, it wasn't like that at all. So uh, starting with that. So uh, what the author claims is that uh, people started talking about Muslim history, Muslim. Uh, it was the British colonial historians who came here and they came with a lot of their own perspective because they came from a colonial point of view. They wanted to sort of discredit the earlier regime and uh, they wanted to uh, show how, you know, it was a period of oppression. It was a period of uh, great um, uh, subjugation and exploitation and that they had come with education and modern perspectives and they were opening India out to a modern new world. Um, I mean, from today's perspective, nothing could be further from the truth, but frankly, this is what I learned when I was in school. It's, it's, it's an unstated perspective, which I had in school. Uh, but the author contests that. He says, this is not true. This, is, this, this whole business is, is entirely a, 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 an invention. Um, 
it, it results from a clash of cultures and nationals. So the British lens is based on dependence. Then he also says, apart from that, they depended a lot on the written world of official chroniclers of the period. And the official chroniclers naturally were, uh, you know, uh, were Persian. They were, they were the official chroniclers of whoever was the ruler during that period. And therefore they would naturally be biased in favor of the ruler. And uh, it, it is not correct to depend only on that because while they will certainly uh, say the facts, the perspective will be different. And therefore they have to be read in uh, the context of local texts, inscriptions, coinage systems, which provide actually a totally different story as to how society was like. Now, uh, for instance, uh, how I want to say is how we persisted for 200 years with this business of Muslim and non-Muslims. It was further strengthened when Warren Hastings, very soon after the Diwani of Bengal and all, he came in and he instituted a legal system which tried Muslims and non-Muslims differently. Before that, it wasn't like that at all. The, there, there was in fact actually no unified legal system. Um, uh, it, it, the legal system, people who went to court or anything, they, they, they went to the local panchayats um, uh, uh, it, it, or they went to the local, whoever was the Kazi. I mean, Kazi is a name which we all have. Whoever was uh, 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 knowledgeable about whatever is the legal system. And this was based on their respective scriptures. So there was no unified legal system at all, uh, either Muslim or, or uh, non-Muslim before Warren Hastings instituted this. And this was further perpetuated by the census, which the British started. And because they didn't understand the various sects, subsects, and the various, uh, you know, the, the incohate um, uh, society of our country, they saw very clearly that there were Muslims. They saw very clearly that there were Sikhs. And they saw very clearly there were everything, everybody else who was neither of these. And therefore, that's how they, um, they, they uh, categorize things in the census. Everybody else was called Hindu. So therefore, the Jains, the Buddhists, a uh, lot of other sects came under the overall uh, umbrella of the nomenclature Hindu. And that is, in fact, when people started identifying themselves as Hindu as such. Before that, you know, people didn't, didn't think in those terms at all. Okay, and certainly not in 1000 CE. Then again, our national movement, naturally our national movement wanted to whip up national pride. So we looked for emblems. We always do, this is very normal. This is very natural psychological thing. We look for emblems and therefore we make a selective choice of the past. We, 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 we bring up people, we say, you know, Ashoka was great because he was Hindu or Buddhist or whatever. It was before the Muslim period. Or we say, you know, Shivaji was the first national whatever figure. The fact is Shivaji himself probably never thought of himself like that. So, uh, so you know, all these things color our present view of history. And history, therefore, is politicized. And we have to accept that fact. But it's natural, it's normal. There's nothing wrong or right with it. I think if we want to understand things better, understand our past better, understand our roots better, we need to keep an open mind and look for alternative views and perspectives. We are always free to make our choices. Okay, so history of Southeast Asia, circa uh, 1000 uh, to 1765. And, oops, sorry. Uh, Oh, sorry. Uh, so here, uh, Eaton claims that this was actually a meeting of two great trans-regional cultures, the Sanskritic and the Persian. And uh, uh, somebody asked me whether Persian is conflated with Muslim. No, certainly not. Um, because, I, I mean, I'll explain that later. Now, prior to the 11th century, the Sanskritic world stretched from Gandhara to Singapore, which means you know, Gandhar means Kabul. Basically, you know, uh, large parts of, uh, of Afghanistan, right down to Singapore, as in the Malayan uh, Straits and so on. It was not linked to a specific region or ethnicity. It traveled very well. 
it was a linguistic and cultural connection and Sanskritic texts, you know, the Ramayana, Mahabharata, if any, all of you who have traveled to the Far East, who have been to Indonesia or uh, uh, Thailand, will, uh, will immediately be struck with the fact that, you know, those cultures are very rooted in the Ramayana and the Mahabharata. I mean, it's, they, and they have owned it as part of their tradition as well. So, sim, so, so all of this is because of this common Sanskritic texts and culture, which was shared. It was a shared aesthetic knowledge. It was a polity uh, and, and the Sanskritic texts defined a certain polity of preserving uh, moral and social order. Uh, you know, they had the concept of dharma, what is right, what is wrong, what are the duties of a king, what are the duties of the subjects and so on and so forth. So they, they, all these things were laid out along with the philosophy uh, and all of this was common and shared knowledge in entire Southeast Asia. Now, during the same period and lasting into the 19th century, what, what the authors project is that from 1000 uh, CE right into the 19th century, a similar Persianate world flourished in West, Central and South Asia. And of course, it started from old and ancient Persia before the pre-Islamic era. <clears throat> so what is Persianate? Now, Persian was also grounded in a prestige language and literature, and it defined a model of worldly power. Both Sanskritic and Persianate worlds were not centered on religion, though they elaborated and critiqued religious uh, traditions. And they were embraced by people of varied ethnic and religious backgrounds. Now, here he further goes on to define what is Persianate. Now, we all know Islam started somewhere in the seventh century. 622 is how I put it in my mind. And then you had the Arab conquest of Iran and you had the foundation of the Caliphate. Now the Caliphate uh, started off with the followers of, uh, uh, of uh, the Prophet Muhammad in two, uh, it was a, you know, I mean, from what I understand, uh, it, it, it's almost like the, um, Roman Catholic Church and the role of the Pope. The Caliphate was the moral authority and automatically also gave um, uh, uh, prestige to any ruler. All, all rulers in the, in the uh, Islamic world uh, acknowledged that the Caliph was the final supreme head, which is the way it was in the medieval and pre-medieval period of the Roman Catholic world, for instance. So uh, where the Pope had the final say on everything. So it, it, it was rather like that. However, over a period of time, the caliphate, the, the influence of the caliphate declined. And uh, though Islam spread, um, the culture which, which uh, people embraced was the pre-Islamic culture. And here are the names of Firdausi and uh, certain other uh, well-known period people of that period, they, they wrote Firdausi Shanama is a, is a case in point where he talks about the ancient glorious past of the Shahs, the Padshahs of the pre-Islamic era. And where, you know, he, he talks of uh, an epic where, uh, you know, the king is the ultimate and he's the embodiment of all that is good and everything. And the quality which is most prized in an in an emperor or a, or a leader is justice. He rules with the concept of justice in mind and that what gives him authority and legality. And he also brings in Firdausi, for instance, also brings in a lot of uh, apocryphal stories of Alexander the Great. He owns Alexander the Great as a Persian ancestor as well. And a lot of stories uh, demonstrate all these qualities. So this is considered um, a sort of template and along with a lot of other connected literature, including the philosophies, including uh, the language, the poetry, uh, the aesthetics, the art, all of this traveled along with Islam and the Arab conquest. And then it, it sort of went over into Central Asia. And by Central Asia, I mean Iraq and then, you know, Afghanistan. I mean, what we know as Afghanistan today, but in those days, you know, it comprised Uzbekistan, uh, Turkmenistan, all of these areas, Central Asia, basically. 
So uh, somewhere around this period, uh, just before 1000, um, uh, the language which got revived and re redeveloped is the new Persian, as opposed to the pure Arabic, which, 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 which came with the Arabic conquest. So Persian took a lot of, a lot of, lot of stuff from Arabic, but it, it revived the Persian uh, language and became a lingua franca, uh, post the conquest of Iran in seventh century. Now, uh, subsequently, as I said, uh, after seventh century, Turkic and Mongol invasions uh, led to the decline of the caliphate, but the, the, the Persianate culture remained. And if, if anybody suddenly became a big king or he conquered, he, he, he wanted to add prestige. Any emperor wanted to add prestige and glory to his court by becoming, by patronizing the arts and letters, philosophers, thinkers, and so on. And all of that was actually based on the pre-Persian and Persian culture, which is why Persianate, as distinct from Islamic. So the Persianate culture also uh, heralds uh, a split between the spiritual and political authority. The caliphate, which is Islamic, conflated the two. But the, the, the neo-Persian uh, uh, culture, it, it split it. Uh, a sultan was supreme so long as he was acknowledged as the spiritual power of the caliph. But the concept of kingship had to be founded on the first principle of justice. So, so you know, it, it, it totally separated the two and this idea kept on getting developed later on. Okay, now I want to go come to India straight away. Uh, I don't know whether you can see this. Well, put in a laser pointer. Now, this is uh, India around 1000 CE, where you had what is known as the, uh, the, uh, the, the uh, uh, pre Ghaznavid uh, 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 kingdoms. Uh, India's, uh, India, this is the, the, these are the, uh, the Hindu kings, so-called the Hindu kings, the Indian, local Indian kings who ruled. The Chauhans were here, the Chandelas, the Kalchuris, the Chalukyas, the Cholas, and the Solankis out here, the Pratiharas, the Gadavalas. So this was, this was the kingdom in, in, in 1000. Now, uh, Eton it gives this as a background. And then he escapes, he goes straight away to 1022 and 1025 CE. Where, which he calls this is and this is by the way the Persianate world yeah 900 to 1900 now uh, which 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 goes from here to here the entire Iranian plateau and I'm sure all of you are familiar with these legendary names like you know Isfahan and I think this is big enough uh, right up to here the uh, Khorasan Kabul Herat uh, Samarkand all of these areas. This was the Persian world, and this was India, right? Okay, now, this is just to get a visual, geographical visual. Now, at this point, the Sanskritic political universe, it was a very, very crowded political universe with a hierarchy of rulers. You had small chieftains who, uh, you know, who, who uh, covered a particular area, and you had a larger chifte, a larger king, he called himself a king, who with his army, uh, the, the, the Indian, uh, 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 the, the Indian, uh, uh, what shall I say, the, 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 the polity was, I mean, what does a king do? If he's great, he conquers other places. He creates, uh, uh, he hedges his kingdom about with allies and friends. And how does he do that? sends forth his army to conquer them and he doesn't ruin them because he co-opts them as tributaries. They pay tribute to him, they acknowledge him as a supreme leader and he lets them pretty much rule their own, uh, own kingdoms or their own geographical areas as they were doing before so long as they send him tribute on an annual basis. Now therefore you had this hierarchy and if, if you recall the Mahabharata and all you, you, had the, you had kings, you had smaller kings, you had big kings, you had samrats, 
and then you had the raj adhi raj you know and how did he prove it he proved it by the uh, uh, by the ashwamedha yagna where he sent that horse out to conquer and if kings felt strong enough to fight they would if they didn't they would immediately acknowledge that okay you're the boss so uh, that was the scheme of things and that's how it hand and therefore on a local level geographical local level the political sands were always shifting because it couldn't last forever and forever because it depended on the particular king in power if if he felt confident he would go out he would win or lose or whatever somebody else would come and so on so there was a intricate relationship of allies and best vassals which kept changing but the attempt was always this mandala the, to create the idea being that you know you surround yourself with friends and um, uh you know and their enemies are your enemies and your enemies are their enemies as well and they also had this concept of digvijay of going in the four directions and conquering so a lot of political jockeying went on but it led to an overall stalemate i'm sorry for this for this spelling mistakes by the way because i didn't have time to to correct it so uh leading to an overall stalemate and an equilibrium this is how it went on for you know between dynasties and from year to year um okay now the real story starts with the uh, date of 1022 and 1025 can you folks see me uh, see the whole screen okay so uh, it's called a tale he called it a tale of two raids and that's exactly what it was the first one was in 1022 when rajendra one of the cholas um can i remove this one minute um rajendra one of the cholas uh, <clears throat> uh sent a big army along with his uh, with his general he didn't come himself from tanjavur to the pala empire which is southeastern bengal incidentally you know i'm a bengali and i had to sort of change my view because my idea of bengal in my lifetime has always been you know calcutta and kuch bihar and this bit but bengal as understood during this entire period included all of what we know of as bangladesh and uh, when you hear of the mughals conquering or wanting to conquer bengal it was they were talking of dhaka and chittagong and so on they weren't talking of calcutta at all so uh, uh so he went to the southeastern part of bengal which is you know uh, uh the in fact the calcutta and that entire region so he went there and um he uh conducted a raid he de he he defeated the pala king of that time and uh, uh he that that king had a had a dynastic temple dedicated to shiva uh, I, i mean it was his prestige all the kings you know usually uh, had one dedicated temple which was a symbol of their power and their might and their legitimacy which they uh, patronized and they enriched and uh, you know they maintained so this pala uh, temple in order to show that he had won that he had truly defeated him uh the army of rajendra chola demolished that temple took the shiva uh, statue away with him to tanjavur where it was displayed in his own temple and uh, a, the temple was pillaged the um, the treasure of the king also was taken and it was all carried back to tanjavur two years later three years later in 1025 Mahmud of Ghazni uh came on his last raid on his 17th raid to Somnath uh we have all read how he used to come yearly to raid Somnath uh and he raided it uh and to call the uh to call the treasure away the question is why did they do these things now it's very simple the money from these raids funded their expansionist dreams rajendra chola was busy conquering was the south of india little bit to the west of india 
and to the east. It was during the Cholas that they even went. He sent out a navy to uh, as far up to Sumatra. His, his reach reached right up to there. So in order to fund these wars, he has to pay an army. And uh, uh, you, you cannot generate that much uh, from your own country. Uh, the army also is, is a peasant army. It's, they're peasants. They're part-time cultivators of land and part-time they are uh, part of his empire, uh, part of his army. So uh, it cannot fund. They needed to hire people. So there has always been a tra uh, tradition of mercenary um, armies. Uh, you know, uh, whole bands of uh, professional soldiers or I mean, even semi-professional soldiers who uh, in order to earn and supplement the income when they're not cultivating the land would via, uh, they were contractors, they were labor contractors who would uh, contract these groups to a king who needed an empire, who, need, uh, who needed an army and uh, they would be used to, to conduct their, uh, their uh, whatever, their expansion of their country. Mahmud of Ghazni was the same. He was busy maintaining his kingdom towards the west of Ghazni, which is in Afghanistan, of course, to the west of Ghazni, right up to Uzbekistan and so on. And he needed the money for that. They need to buy war horses. They needed to buy, they needed to pay their troops and uh, so on and so forth. And that is why they took this money. The thing which Eaton, which the author is trying to point out, he said that, you know, raiding and pillaging temples as a source of uh, ready money, ready treasury was a very common practice, irrespective of religion. It, it, it was there amongst every, it was prevalent amongst all of them. And he quotes many more examples uh, on both sides uh, where this was the, this was the uh, accepted normative behavior of kings, let's put it that way. So the victor and vanquished, these were their behaviors, these were their motives. And how did they establish the victory? By looting and destroying. And why? It was basically to finance wars. Now, these were, they behave like this. this it, it comes out later. They behave like this when they're not interested in ruling. They just want to get some easy money. If they're interested in, uh, in, in ruling, they behave differently. The, the mandala theory amongst the Sanskritic uh, culture was, if I want people to be allies, if I want other kings to be allies, I will not completely van vanquish them nor desecrate them. I will uh, initially, of course, the army will destroy whatever is in its path. But after that, I will show leniency. I will co-opt them. I will negotiate a truce and I will have them uh, and leave them as they are virtually. So this is a, a motive which, which carries on throughout depending on what the conqueror wants to do. So Indian treasure now, 11th and 12th centuries, Indian treasure finances Central Asian wars. Uh, these people, uh, the Muhammad Ghaznis, Muhammad Ghors, they're not particularly interested in coming into India. They, they, they have their endless wars with the Uzbeks, with the Turkmenistan, with, the, um, uh, with the Iran, Iraq, and so on. And uh, uh, it, it is also a time when this new Persian literature, philosophy, and text flourishes. And it spreads all over Central Asia. Uh, in uh, regional ports, because the caliphate is already, the, the, the hold of the caliphate is already diminishing, uh, we see the rise of uh, Sufis. Now, the Sufis, the Sufi sheikhs are religious leaders in the sense that um, they are, uh, they start off at least with uh, uh, retiring from the temporal world, uh, and they say that, you know, we don't need anyone to intermediate, intermediate with, with God. We ourselves are directly in touch with God and they, and they preach this philosophy. And they have a whole lot of followers amongst common people because they bring God closer to the common people. That, that, that's the whole thing. And that is why you have these Sufi, Sufi sheikhs who, you know, who, who start their own schools and lodges where they, they, they talk about it, they talk philosophy, they, they uh, you know, it's, it's like um, uh, what we call um, uh, 
sansads, you know, where, where you get together and talk about these things and so on. And maktabs are schools where you teach. So these spread further and it creates a trans-regional Persianate culture superimposing on the local vernacular. <clears throat> so what happens is because there are all kinds of people from all ethnicities, Afghans and Turks and uh, Uzbeks and um, uh, so on, and, uh, uh, and Afghans and, and Pashtu, uh, who are they? Um, yeah, Pashtuns, all of these people, they have their own vernacular language, but what is the common lingua franca? It's Persian, it's this new Persian. And, and the means by which it, it, it grows is through this common literature and philosophy and so on. Uh, I want to mention here uh, the concept of Mamelukes, which is critical to this trend. Um, we have all heard of Mamelukes. We have all heard of the slave dynasty because next we're going to come to the slave dynasty. Um, during that period, it was an established uh, practice to take slaves. You know, all these Central Asian tribes, when they fought with each other, whoever, whoever lost got taken as slaves. And many of them were young, very skilled people, skilled cavalry people. Oh, skilled archers who, uh, because they were on the losing side, got captured. And what do you do with these people? They didn't have a system of prisons or anything. They were enslaved. And since they were very skilled, um, their owners uh, trained them, educated them, converted them to Islam. Because let us also understand, this is a period when many of the Central Asian tribes did not have any uh, specific religion, neither were they specifically um, Islamic. So uh, converted them to Islam and uh, brought them up in their own households, educated them. And since the fortunes of these slaves were tied up with the owner, they were loyal. They were intensely loyal to them because their own fortunes fell or rose with their owners. The owners would be important nobles known as Amirs. We are familiar with that word. And uh, the, the rule was once an Amir died, the, the slave was automatically manumitted. He was free. And then he would also own slaves. He would, the, 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 the whole thing would be perpetuated. And uh, because these people were uh, so close to the owners, very often the owners uh, trusted them more than their own family members. So that, you know, when there was a, 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 a struggle for power or succession, very often it was uh, the, um, the, the so-called slave who, who attained very high positions in the Amir's army or amongst his personal bodyguard. They would be generals, they would be trusted um, uh, governors or trusted uh, 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 or managers of their lands. Uh, these people would take over the succession and own the place. And this was a common trend. And the Ghaznavids, uh, yeah. So this was a trend and, uh, you know, money went to this. You had to buy slaves. You had to train and educate them. So as I said, all the money, how did it fund? How did the Indian treasure finance Central Asian was? It is through this system. And war horses, very important. Um, uh, very important uh, requirement in the wars during this period. Now, um, Ghazni was a center of Persian culture. Uh, this Mahmud of Ghazni himself, uh, he had gone right up to uh, Iran and Isfahan. And in fact, he brought over the entire library of Ibn Sina, whom the Latinized version we know as Avicenna. He was a polymath who had, uh, you know, uh, he was a polymath, so he had a whole lot of literature and library, which he maintained. And that entire thing was transported to Ghazni. And uh, he patronized the arts. We should also understand that because, you know, it was, you know, the, the political signs were very shifting out here as well. So a lot of nobles, a lot of uh, elite military strategists, artists, architects, or all of these people, literators, they're always looking for patrons. So whoever is the person in power, he would employ them. And so they would shift. So there has been a gradual migration 
from Persia, ancient Persia, Iran, and all those areas, Baghdad and everything, right through Central Asia into Afghanistan, where eventually, with the with the with the Ghaznavids and the Ghoris, it came. Now, uh, Mahmud of Ghazni ultimately, you know, controlled part of northern Punjab as well. So, uh, yeah. <clears throat> now, their kingdom in northern Punjab was familiar to the Sanskritic world. They were Islamic, yes, but they were familiar. They were not unfamiliar. In fact, therefore, uh, when they talked of these people, Mahmud Ghazni raiding and all that, they did not refer to them as Muslim raiders. They referred to them as Turushk, meaning Turks, because that was their ethnic identity. And uh, therefore, they refer to them either as Turushkas or Hamiras. Hamiras is the Sanskritized form of the word Amir, which is Arabic, meaning, you know, noble. <clears throat> so in the 11th and 12th century, Ghaznavid coinage uh, in Northern Punjab, that is, uh, you know, up to Lahore and so on, uh, they bore the same legends and the Hindu Shahi dynasty, the Shiva's bull and the Devnagari script and all. They did not change the coinage. They went ahead with it. Um, it was only in the Western part of their empire that they had their own coinage with the Arabic lettering and so on. So Hindus were very prominent in Ghaznavid army, both as commanders and as con contingents. So th there appears to have been no um, clash of religions or any kind of religious consciousness. I mean, you were what you were, you were what you were. It didn't matter really either way. Okay. The, Ghazna the Ghaznavids introduced the following three things, which is important in the development of the entire, uh, entire uh, medieval rule in India. Uh, they introduced a ranked and salaried bureaucracy, uh, bureaucracy, which was tied to the collection of land revenue. And we have this to this very day in India when we talk about our collectors, right? Then there was military slavery, which I have already talked about. There was patronage of Persian culture. And there was a tradition of spiritually powerful Sufis. Uh, many of the uh, uh, um, uh, Amirs or many of the, the kings uh, they looked to Sufis to sanctify their rule, as it were, to, to agree with them. And therefore, you know, they would, they would give money, they would, they would try and give land grants. It depended on the tradition of Sufis. I, I did a little bit of research on Sufis and, you know, India is primarily the Chishti school, which believes in total separation of uh, religion and, and, uh, and uh, uh, state. Uh, uh, they did not go anywhere near the power center, uh, uh, temporal powers, anything like that. They maintained the distance and so on. But there were other uh, schools of uh, Sufis who owned land. And you know, the moment you start owning land, you start having revenue. And if it becomes too big, it is bound to attract somebody's envy. I mean, I leave that thought with you. And you get drawn into the politics. Um, Now I'm I'm not going into the details of the 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 Muhammad of Ghazni and Muhammad Ghor who came afterwards and so on because that's history we've read about it and then I'd be only giving you a history lecture no I'm I want to bring out the ideas uh, you know and the unifying ideas and the transition that happened and the synthesis that happened uh, during this entire period uh, of which. Um, these so-called invasions and rulers, they were catalysts. So the, uh, uh, the 13th to the 15th century sees the, the, the Sultanate system. Uh, that is, uh, you know, the slave dynasty. You have Muhammad of Ghori coming in, but he dies very soon. And then who? It is his general Qutubuddin Aibak, who is a slave, who becomes the next Sultan. And Qutubuddin Aibak, we are all familiar with him, association with Qutub Binar and so on. And that's why we call it the slave dynasty. Uh, they come here and into Delhi to stay because he had no other, I mean, uh, Qutubuddin Aibak did not have any, any roots in, in, in Ghazni or Ghori or anywhere else. So Delhi was his place. And therefore the guiding political principle was very, very practical. It was co-opting in fact, the indigenous Mandala system. 
I will negotiate, I will have allies, I will be lenient to the local people, I will allow them to go on managing their thing, provided they acknowledge me as the Sultan, the preeminent king, and they give me my yearly tribute. And I organize the land revenues in such a way that it's a win-win thing. And uh, they are the ones who start with the, the Mansabdari system, basically, you know, or Jagiddari system. They called it Jagiddari system. They also called it the Ikta system, which is that, you know, you, your powerful nobles, you give them a piece of land and you say that the revenue from that is yours. You have to give me a certain amount. And of course, the people who are cultivating and all, they do it. And you're responsible for basically administering that place. Uh, they had a system of uh, assessing the value of the land. So they knew that they weren't being cheated and so on and so forth. But it was a decentralized system. Uh, and, uh, you know, it, it, it's interesting to see how throughout this entire period, how they keep, they keep tweaking this system. Um, the Jagirs very often were not uh, hereditary. That means one Jagirdar his son did not automatically inherit that Jagir system. The, I, the, the, the most prevalent rule was if a Jagir died, then you know uh, it reverted back to the crown and then it was up to the king, up to the king, up to the sultan to give it to whoever he considered fit. Very often he would give it to the son if, if, if his father had been a loyal, uh, loyal vassal. But you know, it was very fluid and all that. The other thing that happened during the sultanate was the entire Rohilkhand area, Northern Gangetic Plain was full of forests and uh, Balban is associated with it, another very senior um, uh, slave general who cleared the forests and converted to arable land and thereby increased the revenue from that land. And uh, this is where he invited therefore a lot of Afghans, a lot of the local Pashtuns, Afghans to come and, and, and uh, people this place. Because let's understand during these people, I mean, you know, I mean, we didn't have the kind of populations we have today. So uh, there was plenty of land and he needed to invite people from his native place to uh, come and cultivate it. Um, we need to also thank the slave dynasty for successful defense against the Mongol invasion, because this is the period 13th to the 14th century when the Mongols swept over Central Asia right up into, um, Persia. And uh, they laid devastation in their way, complete devastation. And this was also the reason where there are huge amounts of immigrants, all, all very, I mean, uh, Persian nobles, uh, military strategists, architects, artists, literators, philosophers, Sufis, they fled the, the devastation of the, Mo uh, of the Mongol uh, invasion and came to where there appeared to be more stable sultans, sultanates. And that was therefore Ghazni, Khori, and the slave dynasty. Uh, they had the reputation of relatively stable governments and uh, 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 no, no, no uh, outside influences. And all these people therefore came. So it was a win-win situation. The new sultans in, in Delhi, from Delhi, they became patrons of all of these things. And it further brought in this Persianate culture into, uh, into Hindustan. Balban is also re responsible for starting uh, a series of uh, forts in northern, uh, northern Punjab in order to hold out against the Mongols. The Mongols were unable to uh, breach that. And he started with it. And after that, various people, not just him, various of the, uh, various of the Sultanate dynasty, uh, I, the Khiljis, and also the Khiljis, and the most famous of them was, of course, Alauddin Khilji. And then you had also the uh, Tughlaqs. All of them continued this, uh, this uh, policy of fortifying the northern frontier. And how did they finance it? They financed it by raids on the Deccan. You know, I mean, if you notice, it's a, it's a, it's a very familiar pattern. So they would go into, they would go further south into Hindustan, uh, uh, raid those rich countries, uh, raid those rich kingdoms uh, and, and finance all this in that particular way. But they were successful in this. 
uh, this period also saw a huge influx of refugees from Central Asia, Iran, and Afghanistan. It also saw a huge influx of the best talent, administrative, military, literary, artistic, et cetera, et cetera. And also, as I said, the spiritual leadership through Sufi leaders. It was during the Tughlaq uh, uh, reign that we had our own very, uh, or most famous, though there are many of them, Nizamuddin Aulia, who is still revered to this day in Delhi. So, uh, I mean, you had this school here and they also, they, their disciples went all over India, founding these schools. Uh, because as and when you had more and more of these, I will have to now use the word Islamic people coming in, they wanted a place to worship. So there was a mosque. They wanted a place to, to listen to religious discourse. So there was a Sufi Khanak or, uh, or a lodge. And that's how it, it, it proliferated. So the society, even Muslim society during this period was not homogeneous. I mean, we may tend to think of it so as you know, it was Muslim society, but it wasn't homogeneous at all. And if we look at everything, uh, we will find a very textured picture. That's the word uh, Eaton uses. He says, you know, there were Turks, there were Afghans and there were Central Asians. And they, were, they all had distinct cultural and ethnic uh, identities and religious differences. They belong to different schools of um, Islam. Uh, they, you know, the one considered the other more cultured or less cultured. And there was a very rough division between people of the sword and people of the pen. So you had the Persianate cultured people from Iran and Persia and all that, who were people of the pen. They were the cleric, they were the clerks, they were the literators, they were the administrative people, they were the people of the pen. And they believed inherently in hierarchy, in nobility, because they came from that kind of uh, culture and tradition. And therefore they looked down on Turks and Afghans as basically military upstarts, as rough, as uh, not very um, cultured, as, uh, and also, I mean, they were also relatively newer to Islam. I mean, they had been maybe converted only in uh, the last two or three generations, not even that. So uh, Muhammad Ghori himself belonged to a very, very obscure sect of Islam. It is only to the end of his reign that you know, he sort of said, okay, I will follow this Sunni faith and that's it. I mean, it, it's very often a political decision. <clears throat> so it was, it was not homogeneous. Meanwhile, there was also the indigenous military aristocracy called the Ranars and Thakurs, equal or more powerful positions as the Afghans and Turks. And the Hindus continued to enjoy their social and social privileges and religious practices. I would like here to quote from a very, very uh, prim and proper and uh, 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 um, uh, 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 for in the modern lingo, a right wing um, Persian noble called uh, Barani, uh, the chronicler, who, who, who describes his society like this. He's an official chronicler. And he talks like this. <clears throat> he says, in their capital, Delhi, and in the cities of the Muslims, the customs of infidelity are openly practiced. Idols are publicly worshipped. They also adorn their idols and celebrate their rejoicings during their festivals with the beat of drums and dholes and with singing and dancing. By merely playing a, paying a few tankas and the poll tax, they are able to continue their traditional, uh, their traditions of infidelity. Now, this is the way he's talking. But at the same time, you have the sultans who totally did not, did, did not I mean, feel this way at all. As far as they were concerned, I mean, it, it was a live and let live policy. And uh, the, uh, the Ranas and Thakurs and all these people, they, 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 enjoyed, they enjoyed similar privileges as the local society. Um, okay. The coinage during that period continued as per Sanskritized local norms. And you know, Iltu, uh, the, a coin of Iltu Smish's period, for instance, says in San Sanskritized, it says Suratana. Suratana is the Sanskritized forms of Sultan. And they add some, his name, given names was Samsuddin. 
So it says Shri Samsaddina. And that's how his coin is, 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 is named. So it is a Sanskritization. And uh, this, they were quite comfortable with all of this. And there is another very interesting story. So, so uh, Eaton says, okay, so this is the official court chronicler who is talking like this, but uh, how did the local people feel or how did they look on the, 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 the sultans and, that, uh, uh, and, and their rule? And he then talks of Palam, uh, uh, in those days, 13 kilometers away from Delhi, but that's a long distance in those days, totally unrelated to the ruling class, totally unrelated to anything. There is a local Thakur in 1276, he digs a well as, as part of a, a, of a benevolent project for the local people. It's a very large well and all that. And then, then it needs to be inaugurated. And he calls a pandit, Yogeshwara, to inaugurate it. And I would like to read out from that a very interesting bit, a small snippet, where he says the, the inscription, the inauguration uh, inscription of that well reads like this. <clears throat> salutation to Ganpati, Om salutation to Shiva. Then it says, the land of Harinya, Upper India, was first enjoyed by the Tomars and then by the Chauhans. It is now ruled by the Shaka. Shaka means the Scythians, the Central Asians, kings. First came Shah Badina, Muhammad Ghuri, and then Khudavadina, Kutubuddin Aibak, master of the earth. In his Sultan Balban's kingdom, abounding in benign rule, extending from Gaur, Bengal, huh, from David region, I mean, this is all very, very flowery and it is a gross exaggeration, but this is how they are, how they are invoking, invoking it. And they go on to say, you know, during their land, everything is peaceful. Everything is going on wonderfully. Uh, there is law and order. And uh, this was something which I think the, 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 the ruling power never saw, never got to see, never even knew about. So it's totally independent of any influence, let us say. But this is something which they did. And this is something which, this is a style of uh, inauguration, which is very common to the earlier Sanskritic um, traditions. And in fact, Eaton draws a connection with this and with another one, which was done in the Vijayanagara kingdom later on, uh, where a similar temple was inaugurated with this kind of language. So uh, it, it, it's formalized, it's stylized, but the content, is similar. And this is, how the, so uh, what, what he's trying to prove is that, you know, the local people accepted the Sultanate. There was no problem there, so long as it was just. 14th and 15th centuries, <clears throat> the themes in this century, this is the decline of the, this saw the decline of the Tughlaqs and most important, it's a, it's a watershed, is Timur's raid in, 19, in 1398. That's the end of the 14th century. So I must mention here that during the Tughlaqs, uh, I mean, Muhammad bin Tughlaq, we all know about him, extraordinary and strange man, but I will take the opportunity here to mention that, you know, his court certainly uh, patronized some of the most famous uh, arts, artists, literateurs of the times. And this was a time when uh, this uh, Al Baroni also came to visit and so on and so forth. <clears throat> okay. Now, after the Tughlaqs, there was a lot of fragmentation and absence of centralized rule. All his generals carved out little portions of themselves, you know, Delhi, uh, Bengal, uh, Bihar, all of those areas. They all, uh, Guj Gujarat and so on, all of these areas, uh, they, they, they all uh, broke up into fragmented ruling, uh, but they incorporated the Sultanate style of admi uh, administration, which is what they say is that Ikta system. So even though the centralized rule went away, the style remained. Um, there were very uh, varied kind of social, uh, political, economic orders in Gujarat, Kashmir, Bengal, Vijayanagar. Eaton then describes in great detail how you know the various dynasties uh, developed in all these three places. Uh, Bengal, Gujarat and Bengal, uh, you know, it, I mean, there were a lot of uh, 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 Islamic rulers. Kashmir initially had uh, um, uh, Hindu rulers, but then became Islamic. And Vijayanagara was a Hindu ruler. Uh, but, you know, uh, they developed 
adopting the same sultanate style of administration, which basically ensured a reasonable land revenue to the kingdom for maintaining law and order. And their common motive was to safeguard uh, economic and agricultural activity. Because let us not forget, this was also the time when India was very, very connected to the entire world on the West, right up to uh, uh, Europe, and on the East, right up to uh, Indonesia, where, uh, in, uh, I mean, it wasn't just spices, it was basically uh, India's textiles of all kinds, which, uh, uh, which uh, went all over the world. And the, the balance of payments and the trade was India exported textiles uh, and spices, and it was paid for in silver, which was very much required because India did not generate silver. It was only the Sultanate which had silver uh, because they raided various places. In the other places, it, you know, the, 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 the coinage was all kinds, you know, it was, it was copper, it was cowrie shells, it was all that kind of a thing. But with the influx of silver because of this textile trade, um, one started having a centralized kind of a coinage all over the country. Okay, yeah, okay. I'll try and hurry up, very difficult. So anyway, this, this also, this also um, um, uh, so there were a lot of regional courts and they all developed with a similar kind of political structure. And it also saw the emergence, a lot of ethnic, um, ethnic identities. <laughs> Rajput was an identity which is essentially only a military identity. It is only later that they got ident identified with Rajputana and landed identities because they started inheriting the, the land and got connected to that. Uh, post Timur, Peninsula India was at a crossroads. There was huge military labor market. I had never any idea of the military labor market. Uh, you know, entire bands, entire armies uh, would be traded by labor contractors to various kings who wanted an army to meet somebody and it could make or break a war. Okay, so the polity was very, very fluid and there was integration of all ethnic and religious identities in the polity because it was politically expedient to do so. The administration, architecture, even sartorial fashions, all of that, uh, there was a huge mix. I mean, I don't have really time to go into it, but uh, one minute, uh, okay. Then 1526, Babur comes in. He comes in to stay, okay? Because he basically cannot, I mean, he loses his kingdom, so he comes in to stay. And then Akbar ascends the throne. And Akbar, with Akbar starts the real consolidation of the Mughal worlds and the Persianate world. It's a real fusion of two worlds because Akbar really straddles it. He integrates the Rajputs into the ruling house, as we know, and the Rajputs become national players. There is also the system of Watan Jagis. They, they, they inherit their land and there is lots of, and there is total religious freedom. So Rajput Sanskritic and Persianate cultures are reflected in the architectural and artistic traditions of the 17th and 18th centuries. I can't go into detail, but it's there. And the other thing is, even though the, the, all, the, all the Mughals pursued a system of, uh, of expansion of empire, they went with their armies. But end of the day, the, they won their territories through negotiation and compromises at grassroots level. You paid off somebody, you co-opted somebody, because that somebody thought it was more politic and in his own interest to do so. There was no concept of nationality as such. Okay. <clears throat> then I'm talking about the Deccan and the Africans. This is my takeaway from the book. A lot of very interesting items. Uh, the, this is, this is uh, Jahangi. There is a lot of symbolism in this miniature. But one of his big, his, his bet noir was Malikambar. Who was Malikambar? He was an Ethiopian slave. Otherwise known in those days as Habshis. There was a tradition of military slave slavery from Central Asia, as we saw with the Ghaznavids, but in the Deccan, there were Ethiopian slaves, similar things. Um, 
uh, Ethiopia uh, uh, um, would uh, just catch some African tribal uh, Africans who are not Christians and uh, sell them to markets. They would they would be sent to uh, Iran, uh, educated, converted to Islam, and they, they were very good military strategists. And then they got inducted into uh, the Deccan because Deccan also a lot of political jockeying was going on amongst the various kingdoms and. Uh, they needed armies, so you, 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 you paid for the armies and many of those armies were headed by this, by Ethiopian slaves. And Malik Ambar was a very famous one who ruled the Bahamani kingdom uh, in name for very many years. Uh, he co-opted Maratha cavalry units. That's where you found the Maratha, Maratha cavalry units uh, get together and become an ethnic identity, which finally led to the rise of Shivaji and Maratha power. And it arose from the patronage of these regions and these sultanates. They were in the service of um, Islamic sultans. Uh, the Bahamanis there instituted the system of Deshmukh, which is like the Ikta system only, same system. Um, <clears throat> then Aurangzeb. Now I'm not going into the details of Aurangzeb because I have to finish fast and anyway, it's impossible. But the point is, you know, Aurangzeb uh, spent the last 25, he ruled for 60 years, last 25 years of his life in a futile pursuit of the Deccan Sultanates and the Marathas. And it weakened the empire. His treasury got depleted. And that is, that is the main reason they couldn't pay for their armies. They couldn't do anything. And why did he do this? It was, a, it was an E-day fix with him. Plus he was anxious because they had a system of which, you know, your sons could always depose you. He had deposed his own father. So um, he therefore made sure that he was at the head of an army all the time. For the last 25 of his years, the, the court was a moving court in the whole of the Deccan, it moved with the army. So all of these things weakened the Mughal rule and gave rise to emerging identities of Muslims in Bengal and Punjab, far flung reaches. They were pastoralists who didn't have any particular, they were not part of the the Hindu caste system or the fold or anything. And since these were the areas where uh, you were clearing land and settling down as agrarians, uh, you know, uh, a lot of the, the sultans encouraged and the Mughals also encouraged a lot of people to go there, gave them those lands and says, please colonize those lands, make them profitable, cultivate them. So these people went and they got local people, local labor together who settled down and also became agrarians and therefore identified as Muslims. So it is a byproduct of interconnected economic and political uh, geomorph and geomorphological factors. The Sundarban deltas got cultivated. It was dense jungle. And the pastoralists in uh, upper reaches of Punjab, they also transitioned to settled agrarian activities. But that is why you have a concentration of Muslims there, is why I'm saying. Okay, so Mughals and Sanskritic culture. Now, they appropriated pre persianate culture, especially Akbar and Jahangi, and also the Sanskritic culture. They maintained a huge lot of Brahmin and Jain scholars who had a significant presence in the court. They, they ran the treasuries, the mint and everything. Uh, they sponsored translation of many Sanskritic works into Persian and vice versa translations of Mahabharata and Ramayana. And it is during this period that it was here that all the Persian dictionaries were issued in the world. The, the center of Persian knowledge and uh, a culture shifted from Persia, from Iran and Central Asia to India. India was the hub. And that's why you call it the Persianate age. Because, you know, it, it, was, it was then the... The, the hub of the Persian culture, which also included in it, 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 it um, incorporated a lot of Sanskritic elements. And we can see this reflected in our languages, which developed uh, Hindavi, Deccani, uh, which became Braj, which became Urdu and so on. It's all, all, all from, all from, from uh, this proliferation of uh, the Persianate culture and um, what shall I say? So there was a, and also of all scientific knowledge, astronomy, astrology, uh, medicine, and so on and so forth. There was a mutual exchange of knowledge in all fields. There was a cross section, and this is what we are today. And otherwise, okay. So the conclusion. So eventually, 
it, this is reflected, as I said, in the development of the English languages. And um, with the decline of the Mughals, both Sanskrit and Persian fall by the wayside. You have a development of the modern Sing languages. Arang, uh, Akbar, Acha, then also modernity. Then Eaton makes pains to say that European colonial, colonial rule did not usher in modernity. Akbar and Aurangzeb both set India on a path to modernity because Akbar established principles of efficiency, discipline, and rational order at every level of governance. And Aurangzeb did not believe in, you know, that the Sultan is supreme and it's based on his whim that you should rule. He had the vision of a state run by an impersonal law, a rule of law. And he, in fact, initiated, took four years to, to make a compendium of law, which would be applicable to everybody. It never got implemented, but he had this idea and he tried to implement it. So this is a conclusion. And I'm sorry I had to do less than justice to this book. Uh, I'm open to questions. It's a, it was, you really have opened our mind to what was it, what it was all about. Uh, the history that we read was yes. so different centered with the British. Okay, yes. I think let's move into, yeah, everyone. The history that we have read was completely British oriented, that that was it. And, well, you say the victors always write the history, write history, yeah. and that's yes. how it is looked at it. Absolutely. So, I think this opened our mind, and I'm glad that you brought the subject up. I'm going to ask people if they have any questions right now, because I think I was stunned. I was very stunned in the whole situation uh, here. Okay. So, guys, who, who would like to come up and talk? Hey, Mukul, you have read the book. Mukul, I think you are the right person. You had to read the book. Where are you, Mughal? Gautam? You are um, hi. So until, uh, can I say something? Yes, Gautam, we can hear you. All right, I was, uh, I was hooked on to this uh, talk because from the very first uh, sentence or the first opening, uh, Luna Mukherjee mentioned that language is a window to the culture. I mean, it was. It's a truism, but it, I... it was a fascinating statement. Oh. And uh, also, uh, it's definitely something which I would That's like to read now this book because it sets a, a, she sets uh, certain uh, aspects like the Ghaznivad armies had Indian commanders, Hindu commanders, just as perhaps Shivaj Maharaj had. Uh, Muslim commanders. Yes. Then uh, we, she went on to say something about the differentiation between raids and conquering and ruling. Yes. The raids were raids of like of uh, of Somna mm. and of the Chalukyas or Cholas into Bengal to take yeah. over the Shiva. They were Hindu Chalukyas Cholas who took away the Hindu from the Hindu uh, Pala dynasty. So it's fascinating that raids and the difference between uh, and that and conquering and ruling and synthesizing their religion or the way of life or living there and not destroying or taking away plundering the temples or the anything else. She spoke of synthesis and Sufism, which was uh, very interesting. In fact, um, I'd like to add here, Somnath, yeah. Somnath Temple, by the way, there are records of Somnath Temple where they keep talking about uh, protecting and fortifying the temple against, for instance, the Parmars. Hindu Rajas also raided Somnath because it was so rich. So it's it's not just, I mean, you had to be rich to attract anybody. It, it was not linked to any kind of uh, religious feeling. That's one thing. And uh, the other thing is, um, uh, you know, the, the Mughals particularly and all the, all the sultans, they, you know, if, if they were conquering a new country, they would start by destroying whatever is there in their path, yes, to establish victory. But subsequently, if it's part of the empire, there are enormous number of instances where they have maintained and restored Hindu temples because it was part of the empire and therefore uh, entitled to uh, rulers' protection. Exactly. So this is not an issue in those times of religious no. armies or religious no. 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 conquest. This was no. purely dynastic or uh, enemies and 
conquering <laughs> land and just History, establishing yeah. the rule. Nothing to do with religion whatsoever. No. Which is proven by the fact, I mean, the last controversial statement which I went on to say, the very last about Aurangzeb, perhaps being uh, demonized unfairly or whatever it is, but it perhaps was aiming for a more kind of uh, egalitarian or more uh, universal law. Yeah, universal law outside of the, you know, the, I mean, it's, 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 it's like democracy, you know, you have a constitution and you <coughs> buy that. So it, th that was the concept he had. I would say it was very, very modern. I, I, I wouldn't go too far to uh, I, uh, kind of praise Aurangzeb, but this is a certain no. aspect which one is not which aware of. One didn't of. know, one didn't know. You might yeah. exaggerate it or what, but it, uh, or not, but it's a interesting thought. Anyway, thanks a lot. Enjoyed it terribly. Uh, Mukul, you have read the book. I would like your take on it. Yeah, actually, uh, Runa covered everything and this question that the points that Gautam made uh, actually sort of <laughs> put everything together. The synthetic, the syncretic culture of Islam and Sanskritized and Persian it, uh, um, you know, uh, uh, cultures coming together and uh, as one girl in my, one of my interviews in the slum said that religion is brought up only when it's convenient as a tool you know to fight otherwise actually we all here live uh, very much in peace so yeah. so you know it's Gandhiji said the same thing he said this whole thing about Hindu Muslim is a creation from the British times it's Absolutely. really nothing to do with uh, you know, uh, the, the, the ancient times or the times from when uh, uh, Muslim rulers came into India. It's, it was, I think, after 1857 mm -hmm. when um, the British saw the closeness of the Hindus and Muslims in the War of Independence that they started thinking yes, of how yes, to yes, further yes. perpetuate divide and rule that they began to look at, uh, you know, the histories of the two as separately. And there was there was a British author called Robert Sewell who yes. also used to write uh, about saying this uh, whole thing is, is the yes. Hinduism's uh, sort of answer to, to all the Islamic invasions. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, even Manu Pillai says that how syncretic the whole thing was. So, so actually, um, as as um, Gautam just said that, yeah, it's it's um, you know a new way we have to look at this period and not as um, invaders or looters or you know um, because Hindu kings also did the very same thing. I mean, nobody speaks about Shivaji's six raids on Surat. So. You know, today or Shivaji's or or all the Maratha, the Bargis, those uh, cavalry people, they devastated Bengal. As I said, I'm Bengali, and you know, you have a literature talking about the Bargis coming and raiding, and there are uh, devastating eyewitness accounts of how horribly brutal they were. Yeah, yeah. So, so yeah, so uh, this has uh, put to rest certain you know uh, history that we have grown up with. That is that is I think what Richard Eaton's point is. Point is whether yeah. we whether we want to accept it or no. Mm -hmm. I think some of the right wing won't won't like it, but there it is actually. Yeah, yeah. Thank okay, you. thanks. Uh, in Hindu, you're there somewhere, and Hindu and V.S. Ram. I would like Hindu and V.S. Ram's take on that. Hindu. Oh, can I? No, oh, more to take on. Okay. Uh, you know, until until they they speak, uh, I just wanted to say that it is so refreshing that a perspective is not religion oriented. So refreshing, especially in today's times. And uh, another thing I noticed you talked you talked about Ethiopian slaves yep. and the sale. So does this link up with home going in any way? No. Because uh, no, this is no, because you know Ethiopia was Christian, mm -hmm. and Christianity forbids slave trading. Actually, I mean they weren't allowed to sell their own people into slave trade, so they would their outlying neighbors they would capture, but they needed money because they wanted Indian cotton. So how will they pay for it? So they would sell slaves and get Indian cotton, and it would be very often Arab and Indian traders who would take these slaves and ship them to uh, Iran, Isfahan, uh, Baghdad and all those places. That was the slave market. And they would ship them there. Amirs would buy them, train them. And uh, many of them, they were imported. They were actually imported in, into the Deccan. Mm -hmm. 
because the deccanese did not have in their own uh, political scuffles they did not have access to war horses enough therefore no cavalry and they had no access to um, uh, uh, enough labor so uh, they needed the expertise and this was how it was supplemented the military labor market eaton goes into in a lot of detail and it was eye opening for me because you know military uh, this thing also has the effect of uh, transferring different people to different parts of the country because they go where the money is and i was looking at it from the point of view of our current we see in, in india today migrant labor yes. this is the same people who would have joined the military labor market because they were unskilled mm. they were uh, cultivators during the season rest of the time they needed some money to earn or whatever and uh, they put themselves at the disposal of uh, the labor contractor right so they would move around the entire country also bringing a lot of things together uh, i i see jyoti uh, jyoti puri is somewhere there she is based in uh, uh, toronto jyoti do you have any comments on this i wanted to thank you for your detailed Hindu. study of the centuries runa and uh, what is very interesting is that these raids and the slaves who came up and became important people yes because they were the advisors of yes. the king mm. and these old legends tell us how if the king got murdered then it was at that stage that the uh, whoever was the slave leader then became a top boss and became powerful yes. and uh, and survival the raids is all about you know market and survival that's what is the story the whole story is all about how the culture meld with with the raids and if this mandala concept was uh, was was improved upon or thought of then maybe the cultures would have been richer what we got from the persians art poetry architecture you know even the flowers that we have in our fabrics many yeah. of them you say persian rose you say i mean that uh, time is from persia yeah. so the yeah, wealth the motives, of the, the motives the art yes it's very true yeah. i i and you know eaton touches upon it he he touches upon the inflow and the balance of payments and you know how the how the 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 various europeans who came they bought because the whole of europe survived on indian textiles and uh, they they paid for it in silver coin and they found that you know uh, their treasury was being depleted so that is how the east india company and others started a system of of uh, of um, uh, cornering the labor market the textile workers and exploiting them because they came from an industrial uh, society which exploited the workers and you didn't have that system in india at all i mean he goes into detail on that i can't really harp on it but it's really fascinating prudha i believe your granddaughter also was listening in my daughter in law no but not daughter in law was there but Her oh my grandson! That's yeah, if you, yeah. Don't be misled by his hair. Huh? He's got very long. <laughs> okay, uh, Latika, do you have anything to say? Uh, yeah, I'd like to ask a question, Aruna. Yeah. Uh, Aruna, uh, so far we've uh, spoken about the influences that have come into India and got established here, and uh, as we talked about syncretism and so on. I want to ask you if anything from India went into other countries. Of course, plenty. But it, does Eaton speak about that? No, Eaton does doesn't speak about that because he talks of this period as a Persianate, the meeting of Sanskritic and Persianate into a syncretic whole. But the if you, for that, I think we would have to go to uh, a little before this period, uh, which is you know four hundred to seven hundred when the Chola dynasty was very very strong. They went into Ceylon. right and they went right up to sumatra and java and i mean if you go to those countries uh, you know you feel at home because it is 
such a such a Sanskritic kind of uh, culture, irrespective of what their religion is today. How about Northwest words? Not I have you know seen some things in Indonesia, even as far as China and Fujian, you have a Hindu temple. Yeah, there you but, are. Uh, Yes, ah. it has gone up to there. But yeah. how about countries to the northwest of India? Did uh, all these raid, raids which happened with Ghazni and Ghor and yeah. other later on with Nadir Shah, well, uh, it was, the, did they go the, back with anything Indian that spread in their country? Syncretic, syncretic culture, which was the Persianate culture, which incorporated Sanskritic culture, prevailed up to the borders of uh, the Mughal world. Let's put it that way. Okay. But meanwhile, I suppose in Central Asia, well, in, meanwhile in Central Asia, a different thing was unfolding. They took very many centuries to recover from the uh, Mongol raids. Okay. So it was a flow this way, the <clears throat> flow eastward rather than westward. Uh, Ram, VS Ram, are you there? I saw VS this. I thought you would be interested. Yep. I'm yes. here, uh, Satish. Yeah, so uh, first, thank you, Runa Mukherjee, for a fascinating uh, panoramic sweep of, uh, you know, 10 centuries and uh, make a much better understanding of what we are today. Uh, but, you know, I was uh, listening to your account. I was reminded of uh, something that I saw in my, uh, during my three or four year stint in Korea. Now, in Korea, every family has a big book telling them their origins, tracing it back to maybe four or five centuries. I even have seen families with a book where uh, they trace their ancestry to something like, uh, you know, uh, eight or nine centuries. Now, I've never seen that in India. I always used to wonder because my own family, we don't know anything beyond three generations meaning beyond my great grandfather, mm -hmm. I tried to find out more about our origins and things, but it becomes virtually impossible. Now, after listening to you. Uh, we have switched off your sound. You have switched off your sound. Sorry, sorry. Okay. So, uh, so I was saying, listening to your account today, I now understand probably the reason is unlike let's say a Korean culture, which is an isolate uh, monoculture. Yes. You know, we uh, Indians, we really are products of one huge uh, kitchen. Yes. Kitchen, absolutely. <laughs> you know, I agree. A lot of ingredients. Yes, yes, yes. And it's not a kitchen <laughs> where, you know, everything was thrown in one shot right in the beginning, but uh, the cook it happened kept over adding, time. adding, adding new things every time. And so, uh, the ethnic identities, you know, slowly changed also over a period of time with the movement of people. Really? So if I have to trace my ancestry, maybe there will be a Achya. European slave somewhere, there will be a uh, <laughs> Pashto somewhere. Yeah, maybe. So, so maybe, maybe it's good that I don't know it all. <laughs> Kapila, there's a gentleman with a very magnificent white beard. <laughs> That's me. <laughs> Who? Uh, Runa, that was very fascinating for me. I'm, I'm Dr. Eretz Barucha. Incident. Okay, Dr. Barucha. Good <laughs> to see you. Dr. Uh, Barucha, one minute. Dr. Barucha is a well-known bird lover in Pune, practically environment. He is very, very <laughs> keen on getting everything done. Good to see you, Dr. Barucha. Well, no, no, this has been very fascinating for me, Rona, because for the last several years, I've been uh, putting together information about how these different uh, governance regimes that occurred over time actually influenced the environment of India and what it has come about today. Looking at land management, looking at water, looking at the whole way in which different regimes treated uh, canals, managed land in terms of uh, revenue and so on, and bringing all this together into uh, a sort of a matrix of what actually happened in terms of environmental management. So environmental management is not new in India. It starts from the period and comes down to 2020 or, well, 
quite up here. And uh, how these changes occurred is very fascinating because it links very well with what you have been talking about today. So thank you very much. Absolutely. Thank you, Dr. Parucha. Uh, someone has raised his hand. I can't make out who is it. Who's raised their hand? I think I did. Who's that? Jyoti. Jyoti. Jyoti, Jyoti, Jyoti yes. Jyoti is from Canada. Uh, yes, yes. I'm really fascinated by today's topic, and it's been beautifully handled by Ms. Mukherjee. And uh, in fact, uh, I have just one point to uh, add on to it: is uh, India's culture. Uh, I just I don't know how to describe it. It's uh, uh, been uh, amalgamated by so many uh, invaders. Or so many people who uh, came to India and uh, today what whatever we are we are yes. and I am proud of my country for that amalgamation. Jyoti we haven't seen your face switch on your video. Uh, okay. Yeah she's okay. a very uh, good friend of ours we have been met her we've been talking online only with her seeing her after quite some time. Good to see you Jyoti. Yes, okay. good, to more, good to be here. Good to be glad. Mo, yes. any more people? Are there any more? Okay, more take over. I think, I think we've dealt with all the questions. All right, so um, we will wrap up now. Rona, thank you so much. I mean, this was quite a book. Um, how many ever number of pages it might have been, but it contains a lot. A lot. I tell you that I am feeling a slight sense of exhaustion. <laughs> at the end of the session, wrapping my mind around so many uh, things and so many facts and uh, different perspectives to adopt. So it's been a little challenging, you know? Hubris, hubris, I told you now. <laughs> well, thank you so much. You did super research and, uh, you know, thank you for holding our hands and taking us through what he says. You've made it very easy for us. So thank you very much indeed. And uh, thank you everybody who came and who listened and who asked and participated and uh, joined in and made the session lively. Thank you so very much. Now I'll just take a moment to tell you what we have next Sunday. Uh, next Sunday, we have Shanti Menon who is present today. You must have seen. Hi Shanti. She Show is, out. Yeah, she is awesome. presenting another history oriented book next time called The Ivory Throne by Manu Pillay. And if you remember in the last session, Farooq and I were telling each other how well written that book is and how almost surprising it is that a history oriented book should be so chatty and so warm and so easy to sort of dive into with a very human interest kind of angle. So it's a lovely book and the number of pages, I don't even want to count way more than 400. It's a fat book. So Shanti has also had her work cut out for her and she's gonna hold our hand and take us through it next time. Uh, thereafter, on the 3rd of October, we have J.R.R. Tolkien, The Hobbit, and presented by Snowball Satarawala. And thereafter, then we're going to have the cruise. The younger people are thrilled with it. Arpita immediately had a big smile. <laughs> <laughs> okay, Arpita, we look forward to your presentation also of something that has, uh, you know, been special for you? Um, I'll think about it and I'll have mom get back. Sure thing, sure thing. Okay, everybody, thank you so much. See you next Sunday. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye. Oh, Hello, yes, Ram. Oh, he's gone. He's gone, he's gone. You told him, <laughs> is it? Yeah, oh. yeah. He was also a professor at SPGN. Okay. Oh. It's a small know. world. It's a small world ah. everywhere. And his daughter was my student. <laughs> oh wow! <laughs> yeah. I'll give okay. you. I'll give you. Give you VSS phone number later Please. on. Yeah. Okay. All the best, everyone. Bye.